yeah, um, so I work for Museum of London Archaeology, which is a commercially developer-driven um, um, archaeological organisation. Um, I'm going to... Mark's given us a bit of a setup for the, the Bassey Channel project, and I'm going to really give the perspective of a, a geo-archaeological practitioner um, working on it. Um, Museum of London is only one of a number of uh, uh, big organisations kind of collaborating on this. So. Um, so just a really quick re uh, uh, recap on it. Uh, Nine Elms area of South West London, lots of developments happening. My 20 new development projects is out of date, clearly, from what Mark said, with, uh, referencing 50. Um, but many of these uh, developments have been attracted by like iconic buildings like the Battersea Power Station and uh, new developments like uh, uh, the new US Embassy and the Northern Line that Mark was talking about. What did we know before we kind of started this? Uh, I know Mark already referenced this a little bit, but um, basically the Batty Channel became uh, known to the wider archaeological community in London with a 2009 article by my, Mike Morley. And we're, we're calling it the Batty Channel for kind of simplicity's sake, but it, but it is really an over oversimplification. It's, it's actually a big relic, Lake Glacial Valley, exploited by smaller kind of Holocene hydrology. Uh, the drift geology gave us that kind of idea of, of, of where it really lies um, and it, basically it's, uh, it's splitting around, the Thames kind of split around what modern day Battersea Park and formed this, this eye. Uh, one of the other interesting things about the area is that up around here, around near the mouth of the Battersea Channel is a, a drift field hollow. Uh, which is a, the kind of common in a, the London landscape and it's suspected that these features were actually the reason why a lot of the um, tributary valleys, the major tributary valleys in London, actually formed. So we'll come back to that a bit later. Um, there are a number of kind of, we've got like the Battersea Eye in this area and there are a number of gravel islands that are, are important to, to London's history. We've had uh, prehistoric remains found frequently in, in East London on, on gravel islands, Roman remains on, on gravel islands in Southwark, Westminster Abbey was founded on a gravel island on Thorny Island. But um, Batty Channel's a little bit different because uh, a lot of these gravel islands are formed in uh, delta like networks uh, from uh, spring-fed um, river systems and Batty Channel isn't really a, a, an independent spring-fed river system. It's a uh, it's, it really is a secondary channel of the Thames, so it's a it's a bit different from that respect. But apart from that, we've got we've got the archaeology, which was interested in the area. We've got medieval timbers, uh, Bronze Age artifacts, Anglo-Saxon fish traps, but these are all predominantly found on the foreshore, um, and we didn't really have very extensive archaeological record for um, the the kind of landward part of of this area. Um, so the, the, the opportunity that was presented to us, um, this amount of uh, development gave us a like, significant chance to investigate this kind of unique archaeological and, and, um, and um, geomorphological kind of landscape. Um, because of the number of the practitioners and, and the different curatorial offices involved, uh, as Mark said, Historic England set up this, uh, the Bassey Channel project, and the aim was for us to, to share knowledge um, un unpublished and, uh, and unreported uh, information as we were going forward so that we could more effectively um, uh, investigate and, and, and kind of protect the, the rapidly threatened heritage resource in this area. Now, how did, how did MOLA as an organisation kind of do these type of things before the Bassey Channel project? Well, um, MOLA's portion of the kind of data set that we're looking at um, formed part of the, the MOLA deposit database for London and um, we've got about 600 deposit we had about 600 deposit records in in the in the area we're looking at now but across London the MOLA deposit database kind of includes about 13,000 um, deposit records um, and they're all kind of gathered from different uh, commercial initiatives like the Lee Valley mapping project uh, the 2012 Olympic development and um, the Lower Thames uh, Crossrail project and other kind of smaller all the work. Um, but what type of data are we kind of talking about in, these, in this database? Um, predominantly it's a British Geological Survey data um, and this is great because there's, there's lots of it, it's free, uh, 
The downside is that it's, it's not taken for archaeological purposes, it's not taken for geo art purposes, and the, the information can, on Holocene sediments can be quite vague and not really fit for purpose. This improves slightly if it's a geoarchaeologically monitored geotechnical work. But of course, the best types of, of data we've got in the database are the, the geoarchaeological uh, purposive boreholes or geoarch descriptions of archaeological sections. But of course, these are, these are more expensive and they form a smaller part of the database. Uh, but as, as projects like this move forward, these are, these are the types of data that grow, the good types, hopefully. Um, and how do we use this data? Uh, across, across London and um, the kind of southern England, a lot of the uh, big commercial firms uh, deal with data in quite similar ways. Um, a lot of us store it, uh, store the kind of borehole logs and the archaeological section logs digitally in uh, programs like Rockworks. Um, we then use, the, uh, use those types of systems to create uh, um, uh, deposit models to define lithology and a, a separate interpretive stratigraphy and um, to, to change these into um, um, transects to then try and pull in the broader kind of geo-archaeological toolbox, paleoenvironmental proxies, um, uh, uh, biochemical analysis, dating, and an actually archaeological record. And this helps to, to refine our models. Um, we then go on and, and export the data into system, spatial systems like ArcGIS and, and use some of the, the toolboxes in there to interpolate um, digital elevation models uh, based on these point data we can then kind of work out surfaces. And primarily in commercial archaeology the, the main surface we really focus on is this um, surface of Pleistocene deposits. Um, this, this really forms the, um, the kind of early Holocene topography that your, your Holocene deposits have uh, uh, developed on. Um, we do occasionally model um, like key deposits like peats, thickness of peats and things like that to try and really focus on where our resources might be for uh, reconstruction. Um, the inferences uh, are then made based on like kind of landscape zones that we see on these surfaces to um, really kind of work out uh, uh, archaeological potential for sites and um, to then uh, kind of uh, really uh, refine our final interpretations. Um, the entire kind of molar deposit database uh, provides this kind of platform for, for data synthesis, archaeological prospection and interpretation across, across London. So how did, how did our original deposit models kind of look for the Bassey Channel Project area? Uh, well, to me it looks really basic now, um, but the kind of early surfaces uh, really gave us the idea, combining these with like transects and other forms of deposit modelling, gave us an idea that a lot of our sites were either lying on the edge of some of the ayats, like Battersea Ayat, or uh, within the deeper kind of uh, uh, channel areas around here. Um, it also began to highlight this secondary ayat that was kind of splitting the Battersea Channel Valley into two, two spurs, um, and we named that the, the Nine Elms Ayat. Um, so how do we use this to inform strategies? Uh, in low-lying areas, we had quite deep um, uh, sequences of uh, peats and clays. Um, there's less potential for archaeology in these kind of channel areas. And um, actually digging down to these kind of depths on, on busy construction sites is, is normally logistically problematic and expensive. So we, we generally target these for boreholes so that we've got um, some samples for geoarchaeological analysis later on. Um, the the higher drier kind of gravel islets and iron uh, and islands uh, <coughs> can really be focuses for prehistoric or later archaeology. So they're targeted for trenches and washing briefs. And this is a really standard um, approach for urban commercial kind of uh, uh, archaeology and geoarchaeology. Um, and how did these models and how did our models and strategies change as we kind of moved into the uh, Battersea Channel project? Um, well, basically, the, with the different organisations coming together and actually sharing our raw data, we, we more than doubled um, the, the, the size of the, the, the data set. We, I, I, Mola went personally from 1,600 to about 1,300 uh, uh, data points with everyone else's uh, data. And um, it really proved, improved the, the, the detail around the basically the gravel islands and the, the terrace edges and we got more, more information on, on small promontories, small inlets 
and the differences between really deep channel areas and slightly shallower channel areas. And this helped us target um, areas where we had sparse or inconclusive data and, and really helped um, if you had a, a, a question raised on one organisation site, another organisation site could actually answer it quite rapidly. Um, examples of these, um, at the beginning, our different data, the different organisation really suggested different, um, slightly different landscapes. Um, MOLA's kind of northern data set really showed this, um, this split in the Battersea channel, in the Battersea eye, giving us the Nine Elms eye. Whereas Wessex's southern data really, really didn't, didn't highlight this and they, they didn't think this existed. So um, we knew when uh, basically looking, looking at these sediments, uh, the, the, the organic silts and, and, and uh, other deposits infilling the, the, the channel areas. Uh, they were kind of radiocarbon dated to the Windermere interstadial on top of some of the ayats, and then we had a late glacial, um, um, late Mesolithic dates in filling um, some of the lower channel areas. The sequence then um, uh, filled up with more prehistoric sediments and uh, Thames dominated uh, uh, estuarine muds from a kind of more historic date. But as we, as we then found, as we got these, these dates came, coming in and we got a little bit more detail on the deposit model. Um, it really became apparent that even though these, these sediments up here, these, the valley was a lot lower here, this area was, was slightly higher, but it was still a good two meters lower than uh, the ayats on either side. Um, and we know that there's from, from the, um, uh, the transects and the, uh, the dating, we know that the, there was episodic infilling of the valley that occurred in the late glacial and um, in, the, in the late Mesolithic. But we don't really, we still don't really know whether this was a, a, a wetland fed by the Thames or whether there was a, there was a channel flowing through here into the Thames. And because we've got uh, archaeology on prehistoric archaeology on both the Nine Elms Eye and the Battersea Eye, actually understanding what this bit looked like really has impl implications for uh, the access accessibility between these two sites. So we really do want to find out what's going on there. So we're targeting it for. Uh, more, more sequences with more OSL dates and more radiocarbon dates to really find out when and how this filled in. Uh, another example, the, um, this eastern route uh, of the Bassi Channel Valley, we really had difficulty getting well-preserved sequences there. So when the, one of the Northern Line new stations for the underground went in, um, we knew that despite really difficult conditions of it was a large large area where they were uh, uh, in bulk um, removing all of the all of the sediment that we had to really it was going to be our only chance to get these um, sequences so we had to really try in, in quite quite horrible um, circumstances to try and get get some sequences and we even picked up some later uh, historic archaeology doing that. Um, third example is we got a uh, We've got some uh, prehistoric archaeology first on the Nine Elms Eye and then on the edge of the Battersea Eye, and they really informed each other as to what kind of age and, and type of archaeology we were, we were expecting. On the Nine Elms Eye, we were getting uh, wooden stakes, uh, possible fish traps, we we're getting a, a burning campfire kind of uh, areas uh, with uh, brown bear bone and um, some firecracked flint and pottery. Um, on the Battersea Eye, we were getting uh, Mesolithic flint tools and more substantial bronze and iron age uh, cut features and wooden structures that because we're all sharing the data so rapidly, they, uh, they've informed us that basically some of these cut features, some of these uh, alignments of stakes are actually moving from the edge of the Batiaia into the deep channel areas where we wouldn't normally expect archeology span to be at those deep, um, those lower elevations. And so the, the new projects we're moving into in a couple of weeks, we're really um, changing our strategies from, from normal to actually uh, uh, try and pick these up and focus on these. And we're even arranging cross-organisational site visits for the, for the site staff so they can really understand what's happening um, in this area and with the project as a whole. Um, what issues did we face? I think we've kind of covered some of the good points, but um, over the last decade, uh, all of MOLA's uh, geoarchaeological work has gone into the MOLA deposit database. Um, and it's a great uh, a resource for us, but as a commercial asset, it's, um, it's really restricted to MOLA personnel. But this view is kind of changing within MOLA slowly, and um, 
the Lee Valley Mapping Project Crossrail Lower Thames data are being shared with the Archaeological Data Service <coughs> and um, Historic England. Um, and we're hoping the BCP will kind of further this, uh, this uh, idea of sharing this data. Um, the big challenge of the BCP was uh, creation of systems capable of generating outputs to actually aid um, productive synthesis and debate between the partners. Um, this is, of course, complicated by the fact that we're working on, on different sites that are separately funded and actually at different um, uh, points of the archaeological planning process. Uh, the BCP Forum provides us to, to uh, uh, some extent and has been really, really great and, and, and useful, but we, we don't really have a, a, a centralised dynamic resource to share this data on at, at the moment. And it, as a result, it's, it's a bit slower and more difficult than it could be. We're hoping uh, to kind of move forward with using um, ArcGIS Online and, and the new um, HER that's being set up to actually share this data, but it's probably not going to be realised until the kind of later end point of, of the project. Um, so data collection is coming to an end. Uh, what we've learned and how we're hoping to kind of take this forward. Uh, so basic deposit modelling is uh, relatively cost effective. It's got, um, in, 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 especially in, in southern England and London, it's got clear planning benefits to clients and practic practitioners. Uh, but the BCP is, is kind of showing that uh, if these deposit models are actually integrated with uh, the wider archaeological uh, knowledge base, then practitioners and curators uh, they're, they're better informed and they, about the, the potential of the resource and this really helps to address um, uh, uh, research priorities. Um, it's hoped that this work will actually show that landscape reconstruction has a greater potential to convey archaeological findings under broad research and engagement themes. Um, as a commercial archaeologist, uh, it's, it's quite important to us to, to recognise that uh, even though our money comes from um, developing developers and our clients, the real reason we're doing it is public interest. That's what's kind of pushing clients to pay for this and, and for it to be involved in planning conditions. So, um, in contrast to the kind of excitement of interesting archaeological finds, it really puts the onus on commercial geoarchaeology to show what impact our work truly can have. Um, engaging the wider public and even some archaeologists with geoarchaeology can be difficult, uh, but it can benefit projects too. Major infrastructure projects uh, cover large areas and different types of archaeology and periods of archaeology, quite, uh, quite disparate periods uh, at, at points. And um, it can be difficult in, in single publications to actually pull this archaeology together into a kind of coherent um, story. Um, and again, landscape can be the, the narrative backbone in, in which this is done. Um, on the BCP, this can kind of be illustrated um, how archaeology developed in, in tandem with the landscape and how that relationship lends itself to a narrative for the era. In, in really simple terms, um, the glacial drift field hollow may have encouraged the, 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 the uh, Bassey Channel Valley to actually form. Um, these islands and channel resources were apparently attractive to prehistoric and historic groups with Mesolithic, Bronze Age and Anglo-Saxon activity all appearing. Um, this continued into the late medieval with windmills and, and timber yards. Um, eventually the low-lying channels and wetlands were exploited for water mills and um, industrial docks. The, kind of, the industry that the docks brought in lent itself to the later gas works, railway sidings and the Bassey power station being built in the 50s. And this is all directly informed from the paleo landscape that isn't really um, visible to, to the, the local community that live there now. Um, we can also use new technology to convey landscape narratives in better ways. Uh, the Museum of London's uh, Street Museum app that used uh, digital geo-referenced uh, uh, photographs um, really kind of uh, caught the public attention. And it just showed that uh, actually this, the, the data sets we've got, if we present them in a good way, um, can actually be quite engaging. Um, this type of um, integration is becoming uh, easier with uh, landscape-based systems such as Esri's Story Maps. And I, I advise you all to check out Esri's Story Map uh, website and just look at some of the examples on there. These are web-based digital maps uh, that are populated with text, <coughs> images, animation and videos to convey like, exciting and interactive narratives, educational narratives. Um, final thoughts, specifically on the BCP, we hope to answer some of the questions concerning the development of the IATS, when did they form and when were they in field, 
and of course how these landscape changes relate to um, human activity and settlement and movement across the landscape. Uh, more broadly in commercial geoarchaeology and deposit modelling, we're hoping to look to, looking towards an increasingly integrated and dynamic resource with landscape reconstruction as the framework for archaeological planning and dissemination. Um, in recent past, commercially advantageous resources um, are either hoarded uh, by, by single organisations um, or they just cease to be accessible after the financial limits of a project. And that isn't really good enough anymore. Um, BCP is already showing that collaboration and coordination of a centralised resource is immediately beneficial. And we're hoping that the long-term benefits of such a process approach will be further illustrated as, as we move into the analysis and dissemination phase over the last year. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.